Canadian Census data over the past few years shows that more of us are reaching and surpassing 100 years of age than ever before. With us now on why, why it matters to everyone, and whether it's as good as it sounds. In Ames, Iowa, Peter Martin, professor at Iowa State University, specializing in longevity and the co-founder of the International Centenarian Consortium. And here in our studio, Arminder Reyna, scientific director of the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, and lead principal investigator at the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And Angela Roberts, assistant professor at Western University and principal investigator for the Super Aging Research Initiative in Canada. Angela Parminder, thank you so much for joining us in studio. Thank you Peter, thank you so much for joining us on the line. So before we get into our conversation, let's take a, look, a closer look at the data we just mentioned. So in 2016, the share of Canadian seniors surpassed the share of Canadian children. So you can look at the graph here. The red line, as it's trending upwards, represents seniors, and the blue line is those aged 0 to 14. Today, one in five Canadians is 65 or older. Our centenarian population increased by 16% between 2016 and 2021. Today, it sits around 10,000 to 11,000 people. But by 2061, as you can see in that photo right there, right at the tip, once the baby boomers reach old age, we could have nearly 100,000 centenarians. Centenarians were recently the second fastest growing population in Canada, right behind those aged 75 to 79. Peter, I'm gonna to come to you first. You've been studying centenarians around the world for nearly 35 years. In what countries are people living the longest? Well, typically uh, it is in Asian countries. Uh, Japan uh, typically leads the, the pack of uh, uh, highest longevity and also the number of centenarians. Uh, European countries are um, often uh, uh, in that group too. Uh, I think uh, with regard to life expectancy, Canada is in the top 22. So it's happening all over the world, just a little bit faster in Asian country, countries, particularly in Japan. All right. You had mentioned Japan. Uh, Japan is often described, of course, as the best place to grow old. They have a philosophy uh, that one should treasure life no matter what it looks like. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means that a lot of time and effort is put into caregiving, uh, of taking care of uh, the oldest old, uh, people in their 80s, 90s, and certainly hundreds, uh, that no age is too old for Japan. Uh, that uh, really life is treasured at every moment, from life to death, uh, how long ever it might be. All right, and you had mentioned as well European countries. I'm just curious, what are uh, European countries and Japan doing right? Well, as I indicated, caregiving is an important part. You have to invest uh, in your health. Uh, you have to invest uh, in, uh, in, in, in medical care. Um, and so there, there are basically two prongs. You have to do a lot of things yourself. Uh, European countries, uh, Japan, uh, are much more likely to be active, to be walking, when compared at least to the United States. Um, and, uh, and of course, if things do go wrong, there is uh, immediate uh, support for you. Uh, and that's much more likely to happen in European countries and in, in, and in Asian countries, certainly in Japan. All right, I should mention that the top three people, the oldest people right now are in Spain, Japan, and the U.S. And I'm coming to you, Angela, because you studied the very old in both U.S. and Canada. Briefly, what factors come into play when comparing how each country's society adds or subtracts from their ability to live to 100? Well, for us, we've been, the Canadian cohort's really new for us. So we're just starting to understand perhaps some of the unique social factors that might affect aging and aging well in Canada. But when we look at the studies that we've done to date, largely with people in the U.S., uh, some things that stand out to us are that these individuals typically experience less brain atrophy than do typically aging folks who are at their age, so 80 and over in our case, but whose cognitive abilities are at age normal. So keep in mind, our elite agers, our super agers, are people 80 and over whose cognitive abilities are like those in their 40s and 50s. And indeed, when we look at their brains, their brains also look like people in their 40s and 50s. Uh, so there's some unique social factors as well uh, in terms of good sleep habits, hmm. uh, reading, uh, less television, uh, high social engagement. And we're finding some of the same patterns in our Canadians as well. Uh, what's unique for us here is that we have more superagers who are married to one hmm. another. And we're really trying to understand that phenomenon in our US studies 
That's not the case. But over half of our cohort in Canada are actually husband and wife couples coming together for the study. Very interesting. I do want to pick up on um, sort of the differences between U.S. and mm -hmm. Canada. Uh, walk me through some of those uh, sort of sort of social but environmental factors as well. Sure. I, I understand that uh, you know Canada, we're looking in some areas, more rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about possibly pollution playing mm -hmm. a factor as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so one of the things that we're really focused on in this next study, so we've uh, had 10 years of research so far, adding our Canadian cohort 2021, 2022. So we're really just starting that piece. But we're interested in looking at how can the Canadian society uh, aging uh, group have experienced life differently from those in the U.S., particularly in terms of environmental toxins, uh, stressors, movement and mobility, as Peter mentioned, is something that's really important. One of the things that's different is on the U.S. side, most of our centers are located in urban areas yeah. and our older adults there, while having experienced an agrarian society, the U.S. industrialized at a much earlier time than we did in Canada in terms of large industrial centers. So for us, there's a real interest in thinking about how an agricultural life, a farm life, exposure to farm chemicals or lack thereof uh, in terms of Canadian regulations as opposed to U.S. regulations might affect these aging trends. Trajectories. All right, Parminder, your Canadian longitudinal study on aging has been tracking 50,000 Canadians across 10 provinces. When it comes to biology versus environment, which is a big question that a lot of people want to know, uh, give us a sense of what allows people to live to those elite ages. Right. It's a difficult question to answer <laughs> what allows people to live to old ages. Uh, and I, I just wanted to qualify one thing that I'm not a biologist. I'm an <laughs> epidemiologist who works with a lot of biologists and uh, other uh, uh, disciplinary people, uh, other disciplines, people from other disciplines. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind when we talk about biology, biology doesn't work in isolation. Biology mm -hmm. works in relation to our context and where we live and how we interact with other people. So uh, biology definitely has a role, mm -hmm. how we live. There are certain genetic predispositions we have that put us on our right track, but those could all be mired into problems if we don't live well, or if we are not happy, if we are socially isolated, or our environmental uh, 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 context is poor. So if we start to just focus on biology, we'll be missing piece of pie. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if we just focus on certain aspects of the day-to-day -day living and not look at the biology, we'll be missing the, the part of the picture as well. Peter, I'm going to get your take. Same question to you. You know, I, I think as the public, we probably want a clean line of, you know, right. how much of a percent is it biology? How much of it is environment? What can we control? But give us a sense of what allows people to live to these elite ages. Well, I could only second uh, what we've just heard. Uh, both biology and environment are important. Um, you, we know, we have targeted a number of genes that are associated with longevity, but we also need uh, we also need to recognize that uh, genes need to be turned on. They need to be mm -hmm. expressed. Um, in, in the case of diseases, you know, you don't have diseases in childhood uh, uh, that are the same in th that you find in later life. So these genes need to be expressed. They need to be turned on. And so uh, there is a, a very important uh, combination of looking at genes and environment uh, all together. They really do, um, uh, it makes a difference uh, to uh, to look at both. And that's why most gerontologists work in interdisciplinary mm -hmm. teams, so that you could uh, understand all aspects of, of aging, uh, and we learn from each other uh, in important ways. And then uh, I would uh, second uh, also that uh, uh, longevity and aging is a highly individualized uh, process. Uh, there are many ways, many pathways up the mountain. And uh, we're, we're trying to find the, that secret of longevity, but if, <laughs> if, if there was one, we probably would have found it. There's not mm -hmm. just one, there's more than one aspect that, uh, that connects to longevity, and that's what we're trying to find out. Are there any patterns uh, that allow us to look at uh, longevity and look at aging, and aging well, uh, as, as really is the goal for gerontologists to, to work on? And here I had a bunch of questions thinking I could get all the secrets from you and apply it to my <laughs> life. But with that, Angela, um, you had mentioned something called the Canadian, you call it super agers. And yeah. I, I, we want to make a distinction here because your initiative, your research initiative, follows 500 unique super ager Canadians. Um, and you do look across the U.S. as well. That's right, yeah. What is a super ager? Because it's different than just someone who is 
uh, getting older. There's something obviously in the brain as well. Yeah, for those of us who do this work, we, we think about elite cognitive aging, and, and you can describe uh, elite aging as either by cognitive function, so how memory is, is going as they age, or by physical functioning. Our study really is looking at those elite cognitive aging folks. Um, and so our study has 100-year-olds in it as well, but really the, the early stage for us is 80. So people who are 80 and over, whose memory abilities look as good as or better than people in their 40s and 50s. Um, and then, like my colleagues have talked about, we look at genetics and their brain structure and function and, and all of their behaviors uh, to try to see what defines them differently. So that's, we've defined ours based on chronological age uh, and 80 is kind of our entry point. I, I do, I, with sort of what Peter and Varminder have said, I do want to ask this question because I know yeah. in your research, you have so many anecdotal stories of, you know, what people have done and what yeah. their secret is. And I find, is there anything specific I should be eating? Because I understand there is actually a couple <laughs> of uh, people that yes. uh, you've been studying who have, this is their go-to meal. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so, uh, you know, the one thing that I will say that I, I think all of us will say in our areas of work and our super agers are not any different, the, the best phone call is that first phone call. A recruiting call for this study takes us about 90 minutes because mm. you will hear their life story <laughs> straight out. Um, and so I will say that I, they each are individual, but they seem, many of our folks seem to have meticulous eating habits. And uh, we have one individual who's eaten two bran muffins in the morning and night every day since he was in his 20s. It's his recipe. He makes it. Mm. So that's his particular habit. How old is he? Uh, he is 94. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, we have other super agers who have other eating nuances, exercise nuances, uh, meditation nuances, sleep habit nuances. So what they all can tell you, though, is how they think they got to this point. And that real underlying factor for all of our super agers is this sense of resilience, personal resilience formed in, in challenges, but also personal resilience that comes from having a strong support around them, social supports, family family support, societal supports. All right, with that, I want to pull up a photo. I want to introduce you all to Jan Calmon, <laughs> born in 1875. This French woman holds the record for being the yeah. oldest human being ever. As you can see in that photo, she's holding the a little diploma there. She died in 1997 at the age of 122, mm -hmm. 122. I want to show another photo, because this is quite interesting. This is the same, <laughs> this is her celebrating her yep. 117th birthday. And you can see she's enjoying a smoke and a, and a little, I think a little shot there. Um, Peter, uh, I, I can assume when people think, you know, when you're 117, you probably are not a smoker because we know, <laughs> you know, many studies have shown that that's probably not the best uh, thing to do to, to, to get there. I just want to get your reaction on something like that. Well, if you, if you ask what is the number one health behavior that predicts whether people live a long life or not, then it is not smoking. Uh, yes. A very small percentage of centenarians we have studied, less mm -hmm. than 2% are currently smokers. And even uh, Jean Camon, um, whom I knew well at the time, only uh, smoked occasionally, like <laughs> for the camera, as it were. Um, so, you know, she was not a constant smoker, um, as is often portrayed. You know, we, we like to see those images because uh, it, it seems like you are defying all the odds by mm -hmm. even smoking, right. but it is not something that I would recommend. That's if there's right. something that I could recommend to people to live a, a longer and better life, and, and part why we have high life expectancy is because uh, in many countries we have been able to control the the, uh, the level of smoking, and so um, it's um, uh, it really is a, a clear outlier if you find somebody who regularly smokes at that age. All right, I do want to follow up with you, Peter. You know, it's been more than 25 years, and no human being has surpassed her age. Meanwhile, here in Canada, life expectancy is 81 years and stayed pretty constant uh, over the last decade. Does that mean that we've hit sort of a, a hard ceiling when it comes to the human lifespan? Well, there's a difference between life expectancy and lifespan. Mm -hmm. uh, maximum lifespan, like you saw in Jean Kama, uh, is is probably uh, we've probably reached the ceiling uh, because, as as you indicated, uh, we have people who make it to uh, 116, 17, 18, but then uh, uh, nobody seems to go much beyond that. And uh, Jean Kama was uh, sort of a uh, an outlier there too. Um, uh, life expectancy is really the average uh, of what. Uh, people can expect to live and really is a, a measure at birth. So when we hear about 81, that means it's, uh, it relates to newborns uh, this year or last year, whenever uh, the statistics is given. 
that has continued to increase, except for COVID. We've, uh, we've taken a, 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 a few years back, certainly in the, more in the United States than in other countries. Um, uh, but uh, it will continue to slowly go up, but uh, uh, not as drastically as we had seen. If you consider that 100 years, 120 years ago, if you were born in 1900, life expectancy was only 46 years. Mm -hmm. So we've made great, uh, uh, great strides in increasing uh, life expectancy, sort of having uh, obtained a second life, if you wish. But the gains now will be much smaller uh, over time. So, you know, half a year, a year, two years, uh, and then probably on average that is going to reach the ceiling unless we find some of that magic uh, uh, genetic code that might help us uh, make any changes here. Well, you're going to pick up on that. And Parminder, uh, we talk about the genetic code. Could this change if we were able to genetically program ourselves differently? Well, I'll pick up on something yeah. uh, Peter mentioned, and I think he's absolutely correct in saying that we have reached our potential. And, and uh, there are a lot of debate in the literature. Some people do projections and think we are going to live up to 140, 150, 160. <laughs> but data doesn't show it, it uh, par partly because you need a lot of people in those age groups to predict what is going to happen in the future. And the evidence is not there. There's very few people who have made it. These are outliers mm -hmm. we are talking about. Second thing before I answer that question, uh, I also wanted to make sure that we have a conversation. It's not all about longevity. It's also about health span, how we live. As long as we live, we want to live in as healthy as uh, possible. Uh, I think unless we find some magical biological uh, nugget that changes the fundamental biology of aging, uh, we are going to struggle to figure out a way to extend life. And there's work happening. It might happen. You never know with science what can happen. But so far, that has been a difficult challenge to achieve. Even the mechanisms of aging, biological mechanisms, there's not a single mechanism that allows you to age. There are multiple things that are happening. And, and uh, I, I think the more and more, more and more in, in the mainstream uh, geriatrics and gerontology focuses on how do we increase the health span. All right. Angela, I'm going to come to you. You've been studying a special centenarian living in Chicago. What makes her so unique? Oh, what makes her so unique is that she still has this vibrancy in health. Right, and so it's not that she's just 100, Edith is not just 108, <laughs> uh, but Edith is really the poster representation of what it means to age well. Uh, she still cooks every day. She is a direct descendant of enslaved peoples who came to the Northern US on the Underground Railroad, and she celebrates life and shares that history. And I think this is one of the things that we all draw such joy from in our work. And I, the world benefits from our ability to understand the biology and the environmental contributions in terms of helping for health span and longevity span. But the other uh, important societal contribution of these uh, elite agers, super agers, is that they help us understand our history. Hmm. Uh, they capture for us a living time capsule that, that we can actually continue to learn from and reduce the stigma of aging, and Edith is doing that. So she's on television frequently. She advocates for others. She just had a building at a university named on her behalf, not just because she is older, not just because she's lived in this healthy way, but because she has broken barriers her entire life in the area of race and, and equity. So I think these are the fantastic things that this, these groups and, and these individuals offer to us. And studying them is important for a variety of reasons, most importantly, because they hold our history in hand. All right. Peter, I do want to ask you a question. And whether or not there is a connection here, do, do poor people living in poor living conditions always live shorter lives than those who are more fortunate? Well, probably on average. But again, there's a difference between looking uh, at a population and their average resources that they have and that may allow them to live a long life. But there are certainly exceptions. We have, uh, uh, we have interviewed centenarians in uh, rural Georgia and rural Iowa. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them in, in, in the South had no refrigeration uh, and uh, uh, lived under very poor conditions and still uh, it's what uh, I think what Angela talked earlier about. It's that resiliency. It's being able to uh, uh, to 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 make do with what you have. Uh, mm -hmm. That is so important. And uh, and so another example here of there's not one pattern. Uh, certainly, it helps to have resources. It helps to have. Uh, uh, 
uh, to live in, in, in better circumstances. Uh, but, you know, that sometimes also comes with more stress. And, uh, <laughs> and so, as Angela said, you know, uh, just enjoying life where you are and feeling rooted in your community uh, counts for a lot, no matter what that community looks like. All right. Another uh, factor that I, I do want to ask you, Peter, is, uh, and we see this here in Canada and other countries, is life expectancy between uh, the gender line. Uh, women typically live longer than men. Why? Well, they take better care of themselves. When I give public presentations, I often, uh, and I have some men in their 60s, 70s, or 80s uh, who want to know about longevity, I do tell them, behave more like women and you have a better <laughs> chance to, to make it to 100. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're more likely to uh, seek help, to seek medical care. Um, uh, men are still sort of thinking they can, they can work it out themselves. Women have better social support. They talk about their problems. Uh, so there's an emotional, psychological component to it, too. So there's a lot that men can learn from women in terms of uh, not only living longer, but uh, as Perminda said, uh, also to have a higher quality of life and uh, increasing health span just by taking better care of yourself. Perminder, the Canadian healthcare system is under a lot of stress. Um, is it ready to handle this unprecedented increase in seniors? We've seen the projections uh, early off the top. Is it ready? Well, I, I think in order to answer that question, you have to look at the context within which our healthcare system was designed. The current universal healthcare system was designed in the early 60s. Our average age of the population was 28 or 29. Mm -hmm. Our average age is 42, 43 right now. And, and so the acute care sector didn't have as much burden when the pop population was younger. If we are going to meet the demands of, uh, whether it's a healthcare demands or they are social care demands, we just can't design healthcare around hospitals. We have to move that into our communities, have community structures available, because 70 to 80% of the older people live quite functionally in their own communities, in their own homes. Then there is 20% who have some issues, but then there is 7 to 8% who have complex needs. So we have to map our care system in relation to the needs of the population, and I think uh, governments have missed that opportunity. They are now, pandemic has shown a light on that, that the people are thinking about it. But still, we have long ways to go. Unless we have a good, strong community care system, mm -hmm. our healthcare system is not going to be able to sustain itself. Because on average, some of the data that has been generated in Ontario, if you have to put an older person in a hospital for a day, it costs $1,500. Right. In the community, it costs $250 to provide a good service and people living in their own home, interacting with their own communities and having the social life that they should have. And I think that's the challenge. And, and systems are big juggernauts. It's hard to shift them. And uh, governments are struggling how to make that happen. And there are interests in there, nursing interests, physician interests, other interests that come into play. I think it is a complex issue. It is a collective effort that is going to be uh, needed. I, I just wanted to pick up on something, if you yeah. allow me, that Peter had said. I, I think if we look at around the world, the countries that have high life expectancies are the countries that have done very well socioeconomically, mm -hmm. right? It is a... It, it, the, the social determinants of health have actually led us to reach these mm -hmm. exceptional uh, 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 life expectancies. Mm -hmm. It is an amazing, uh, remarkable achievement of the modern public health system, right? Mm -hmm. That sanitation, that better food, discovery of penicillin, removal of infectious diseases, that has allowed us. And, and as, as Peter mentioned, on average, social determinants of health, including socioeconomic disadvantage, does put you on a, at a disadvantage. Some people thrive in all sorts of circumstances, but we can't all be looking to solutions that are biological. There are social solutions that we have to think to sort out some of these challenges. All right, Angela, uh, I'll get you to pick up on that as well. Like, what does Canadian society need to do to change? I want to, I, I think from our perspective, I pick up and, and agree with what Peter and Parminder have said, and, and it's, I, I want to pick up on one item, the importance of maintaining social communities. I think one of the things that happens, and we know this as people age, <clears throat> is increased social isolation, not necessarily 
a sense of intrinsic loneliness, although that can come with it, but really isolating our older adults from one another and from a community that helps to maintain vibrancy and aging. And I, the infrastructure that we build has to account for that, to allow meaningful connections, not just with pe their peers, but intergenerational programming, bringing children and young people together with older adults. That is how we keep society vibrant, but it's also how we help uh, increase quality of life for older adults. All right, Peter, I want to ask you a question, and I'm gonna ask this question with, a, with, with knowing full well that I might not make friends with this, and my mom might not <laughs> like this question as well. But if there's one cohort that's, that always makes it to the voting booth, it's the elderly. Politicians know this, they entice them with tax breaks. Would it be beneficial if we instead made seniors pay more into the system as their needs increase and our tax base and fertility rates shrink? Well, uh, it is a controversial issue, obviously. <laughs> I, I think about it more as a lifespan mm -hmm. uh, contribution okay. you need to make. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot wait until your 60s and 70s to pay more into a system. You really have to think about it much earlier. In my, in my classes with undergraduate students, I have them uh, estimate how long they're going to live, then I give them uh, the projections, and there's a big gap. People don't, uh, young adults don't expect to live uh, into their 90s, and most of them will, or even older. And so you have to make a contribution early and throughout life. And then if we all do this, if we all have a commitment to pay up um, uh, in our 20s, 30s, all the way into our 80s and 90s, certainly older adults, very old adults should also make their contribution to the extent that they can. But uh, you cannot wait uh, until very, very late life to start doing that. All right, Parminder, much of the work that all of you guys do uh, contains a real element of mystery. What's one mystery of aging that you hope the human race can unlock in the next decade? Ageism. Hmm. Yeah. I would say if somehow our societies figure out not to be ageist, mm -hmm. we will make massive gains in how people age in our communities. And this was highlighted in during the pandemic. With right intentions, people were, uh, in Canada, uh, were sort of labeling older people as vulnerable, decrepit, they were in long-term care, they're all going to die. And unless we change our attitude, we can do every other miracle related to, to the science can provide if the societal impression of what it means to be aged, and Peter's opening comments about Japan, they're valued. And I think that's what we need to think. If we don't do that, there will be institutional barriers, there will be community barriers, there will be individualistic barriers to making uh, things happen in a positive fashion. So th I would go with ageism. Angela, same question to you. Uh, I, you know, I'll, I think that's incredibly important and I won't minimize that, but I, I do think the biology here is important. So one of the reasons we started the Super Aging Research Initiative was to better understand what's going wrong in conditions like dementia and Parkinson's disease. So. I think the mystery is understanding not just risk, but what might be protective factors in these older adults who are aging in, in such a, a, a robust way cognitively, so that we can actually help people who might be on the other end of the cognitive aging spectrum who are experiencing these conditions. All right, my last question to you, we have about a minute left, uh, and I'm gonna start with Peter, we're gonna go down the line. Do you want to live to 100? Why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> I I would not mind living to 100 if I can stay healthy physically and cognitively and socially. All right, Parminder. I, I would give the same answer. If I'm healthy, I want to live as long as possible because there's so much to do in this world and I like to be part of that. But having a health and engaging with community, contributing to the community, and this is related to earlier comment or question you had asked, it's not all about money right? Mm -hmm. Older people contribute to their communities till they die. And I think we have to value that. And as long as I pr can provide that value, I want to live as right. long as possible. All right, Angela, you get the last word. I come from a family of super aging women. And <laughs> so my answer is going to be yes. Uh, but with the same thing in a world where uh, we don't have stigma in aging and I can continue to contribute as long as I can do that, I'm happy to be here. All right, Peter, Ferminder, Angela, thank you so much. Very thoughtful and great conversation. Thank you. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.